This morning's lesson, lesson three, the parable of new wine and old bottles. I'm going to talk about cloth too, but the title lesson is just new wine and old bottles. The parable in our lesson today is invaluable and has far-reaching effect into every Christian's life, whether members of the church of God or not. Pastors, teachers, and all other leaders of the church should gain abundant wisdom through this parable. Our scripture references are found in Matthew 9, 16, and 17, Mark 2, 21, and 22, and Luke 5, 36 through 39. Did anybody study those, look at those this week? Anybody? Glad to see I got a couple of nods. On the surface of the parable, it may sound as if Jesus is only talking about physical, tangible objects. However, he is warning us not to mix the old with the new. Now, I really like this series of lessons, but I think sometimes a little more background on the parables is in order. In this case, we have many words which, when put together, don't really apply to our modern lives in a useful way without further explanation. The thought and intent of this parable is just as relevant today as it was for Jesus' original hearers. So let's go ahead and jump, jump on into that parable right now. Uh, the, the lesson doesn't have it until about halfway through the lesson, but I want to I wanna go ahead and start with it. <clears throat> I'm going to read the passage from Luke, uh, chapter 5, 36 through 39. And he spake also a parable unto them. No man putteth a piece of new garment upon an old. If otherwise, then both the new maketh a rent, and the piece that was taken out of the new agreeeth not with the old. And no man putteth new wine into old bottles, else the new wine will burst the bottles and be spilled, and the bottles shall perish. But new wine must be put into new bottles, and both are preserved. No man also, having drunk old wine, straightway desireth new, for he saith, the old is better." <clears throat> Here in verse 36, Jesus begins, begins by talking about making patches. That may not be clear at first, but that's exactly what he's talking about. Paraphrasing, this first verse says, nobody would cut up a brand new shirt to make a patch for an old one. First, you'll ruin the new shirt, and then the patch you make out of that new shirt isn't going to match the old worn out fabric on the shirt you're, you're fixing. I also thought about this as a possible understand, helping to understand this. Uh, Wendy had a skirt, and the pocket kept tearing out the bottom. And every time it tear out, she said, my skirt pocket's torn out again. Can you sew it up? Okay, I'll sew it up. I'd sew it up. A couple weeks later, she brought it back. My skirt pocket's tore out again. Can you sew it up? Sure. I sewed it up. And so finally, the third time she brought it to me, I, it's, it's not doing any good. That The fabric on the pocket itself was so thin that even if I had put a patch on it, it wouldn't have mattered because the, the, the material was threadbare. Any, any sewing that I had done to it was just going to pull right out. It wasn't going to hold. The only way for her to have a pocket in that skirt was for me to replace the entire pocket. That was the only way for that skirt to continue being functional. <clears throat> this is what Jesus was telling his hearers. Their old ways were beyond repair, and it was time for a complete new change. The old had to be completely removed. The second portion of this parable is similar. When Jesus says bottles, he's not talking about glass or plastic or even clay. Today, we would use the term wineskin, <laughs> where the Bible here used bottles. It was literally the hide or the skin of an animal that had been properly prepared and sealed in order to hold liquids. If you have ever noticed 
the white powdery substance on grapes. Have you ever seen that and just kind of wondered what that? That's yeast. That's naturally occurring yeast that's actually on the skin of the grapes. As soon as the grapes are crushed, the fermentation process begins. This process can take around two weeks, and as fermentation takes place, carbon dioxide is released, and that gas expands. These new sealed wine skins with their fresh skin were able to expand to, to accept that extra volume of gas that took place that was uh, released during the fermentation process. But once that process was complete, those skins had reached their maximum size and they didn't shrink down. They didn't, it's like, have you ever had a balloon that was blown up for a long time and then it deflated and is all wrinkly and stretched out and funny looking? It's the same thing wineskins would do. It would, I mean, a balloon obviously comes down a little bit, but it's considerably larger at that state than it was when it first came out of the pack. And so it is with these wineskins. So if you had taken that wineskin after the fermentation process had taken place in it and tried to use it again to have more wine, that wine skin didn't have the elasticity that it needed to expand anymore. And so what would happen is, it's very clearly described in the parable, the wine skin would burst. And what would happen is you'd have a wine skin that was no longer use, usable because it had holes in it, and you would lose the use of that wine because it was poured out on the ground. So both would be lost. This parable represents the old ways of fulfilling the letter of the law by the Pharisees and Sadducees, by the majority of the Jews, versus following the spirit of the law under grace, as taught by Jesus. The Jews had been stuck in these old ways for so long that they could not even see that this that Jesus was teaching had been God's desire for them from the beginning. Excuse me. They were blinded to the prophecies that foretold of Jesus and his ministry. The majority of the words that Jesus spoke throughout the Gospels came directly from the Old Testament. Yet the Jews rejected him at every turn. Paul and the apostles also dealt with those who sought to mix the law with grace. The first and most obvious example was found in those who required the circumcision of the non-Jews. Sadly, today we see a return of the same, the same kind of mindset by those who are seeking to restore the old Jewish celebrations of the Old Testament feasts and many other traditions found under the law. As Gentiles, these things were never required of us. When we read the book of Acts, what, what do they say? They say, keep yourself from fornication, keep yourself from idols, don't eat blood. These are the things that were required of the Gentiles of Jesus' time, and so they are as far as the law goes. These are the things that are required of us today. As a matter of fact, on the contrary, Paul told the Galatian Christians in Galatians 5, 4 through 1, 4, 5, sorry, Galatians 5, 1 through 4, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. It is our responsibility under grace to allow the Spirit of God to lead us away from the damaging influence of the world. If we allow the Spirit this freedom in our lives, it will be clear through our behavior. Galatians 5, 22 through 25. Anyone familiar with that passage? Just know exactly what it is? It's fruit of the Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. 
and they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Jesus said, ye shall know them by their fruit. The oldness of the letter of the law will not mix with the newness of the Spirit. If we allow the Spirit complete control in our lives, we will see these things. We will see that love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance in our lives. If we don't see those things in our own lives, we've missed the boat. If we don't see those things in others' lives, especially in the church, we would do well to, to pray for them and, and seek God's will concerning what He would have us to do to help them to understand where they're falling short in a loving manner to guide them back to the path that God would have them to take. The wisdom and death, depth in which He is speaking can either anchor us as believers if we take heed to the lesson or drown us if we fail to understand the warning being imparted. The Bible teaches that we should gain wisdom and understanding in all things. Happy is the man that findeth wisdom, and the man that getteth understanding. It's one of my favorite verses here. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. And with all thy getting, get understanding. With everything that you have that's able to get, Get understanding. It's necessary. It's needful for our, for our forward walk in Christ. <clears throat> it would be foolish for the church and or the individual believer to ignore the key principles laid out for us in these passages of Scripture. Wisdom is at the center of Jesus' parable, contrasting the old and the new. The golden truth, 1 Thessalonians 2, 7, through 8, 7 and 8 but we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherisheth her children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because you are dear unto us. Part 1, Jesus' disciples questioned. Matthew 9, 14 and 15. Then came to him the disciples of John, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast oft? But thy disciples fast not. And Jesus said unto him, Can the children of the bride chamber mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken from them, and then shall they fast. The question that precipitated the parable came from John's disciples with apparent support from the Pharisees as well. As they observed Jesus and his disciples, they noticed that the spiritual lifestyle of Jesus and his disciples was different from their own. Therefore, it would seem appropriate to them to question why Jesus was not teaching in a similar, with similar structure for his disciples as John did, since he was supposed to be the one sent from God. Now, sadly, our, do we find in our own lives that any of us have actually ever been accused of being so different to others? Do we live our lives in such a way as to portray the life of Christ by the power of the Spirit working in us? If we do, we will be questioned as in the same way that, John, uh, that Jesus' disciples were. And this is not without reason. Peter said in 1 Peter 3, 14-17, but, and if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you, a reason of the hope that is in you, with meekness and fear, having a good conscience, conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. For it is better if the will of God be so, that ye suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. In other words, we would do well to allow the Spirit of God such freedom in our lives that when others come against us, they have nothing that they can honestly accuse us of. 
They may make false accusations against us, but when others look on, they should see nothing in us that would rightly allow them to lay blame on us. Jesus remains our perfect example. 1 Peter 2 and 23, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed to himself that to him, committed himself to him that judges righteously. If Jesus took false accusations and never even defended himself by acting out toward his accusers, will we be found faithful, faithful witnesses by him when accusations are accurately applied to us? We are called to peace and unity. Anything we do against these two Christian goals, we do against Jesus and work our own eternal destruction. But when we respond as Christ did in every situation, we will lead souls to the throne of heaven where they will have the same opportunity to choose eternal life for themselves. And once again, we look at Jesus who is accused falsely. He didn't jump up and say, I didn't do that. I didn't do that. You're lying. You're just a bunch of liars. He just, the, the Bible says, as a sheep led to the shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. So what makes us think when someone comes against us justly for our improper behavior that we have the right to do, to do anything different? We should live our lives in such a way that nobody can rightly accuse us of wrongdoing. But if they do, and they are correct, we still have no right to open our mouth because they're justly speaking. And if they're justly speaking of us, we need to be aware of that and allow God the freedom in us to draw us closer to Him and away from the things of this world which would cause people of this world to rightly accuse us as followers of Christ of wrongdoing. Back to the commentary here. Bible commentator Matthew Henry states, the objection which the disciples of John made against Christ's disciples for not fasting so often as they did, which they are charged with as another instance of looseness of their profession, besides that of eating with publicans and sinners, and it is therefore suggested to them that they should change their profession for another more strict. Is this all perfectly clear English here? Because that doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. I really had to study that out and see what on earth he was actually trying to say. In English, I believe he would have said, <laughs> John's disciples and the Pharisees agreed that the behavior of Jesus' disciples was not good enough. And so they accused them. They did not act righteously enough for the Pharisees and Sadducees. They hung out with publicans and sinners. And now it seems clear that they were not fasting either. Oh my goodness, how terrible are these people? How could they say that lo they loved God if they were hanging out with sinners? How could they say that they loved God if they weren't fasting? Just like the Pharisees, just like the Pharisees and, the, and the disciples of John were fasting. If they wanted the Jewish leaders to take them serious, they would do well to change their ways and start acting like they were acting. That's not probably the best course of action. Probably not the best thing they could do. Jesus was teaching them clearly the way to behave. And they were behaving just exactly as Jesus had instructed them to. Jesus' response may have surprised them to some degree. This answer to them was, in a manner of speaking, his answer to them was in a manner of speaking because it's not time for them to endure that part yet. He was with them. Jesus was with his disciples at this point for their training. It was not necessary for them to fast as he was present with them. But the time would come when he would no longer physically be there with them. Then the time to fast would be there for his disciples. Matthew Henry also notes how they blamed Christ's disciples for not fasting so often as they did. Thy disciples fast not. 
they could not but know that Christ had instructed his disciples to keep their fasts private and to manage themselves so as they might not appear unto men to fast. Furthermore, it is reasonable to consider that even if Christ's disciples did fast while he was with them, they would not have made it known to the public eye then or even after his departure from them. Jesus had directing them and fast, directed them in fasting that it should be before God privately rather than in the public eye. Jesus said, Matthew 6, 6, 16 through 18, Moreover, when ye fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou fastest, anoint thine head and wash thy face, that thou appear not unto men to fast, but unto thy Father which is in secret. And thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Jesus made it clear that showing off would never impress God. Openly appearing to suffer may make one appear to be righteous, but in reality, the only thing it did was boost the ego of the one who was doing it. This came to be expected during times of personal fasting among the Jews. Sadly, as things go, what is considered normal is acceptable, and anything else is looked at as deviant behavior. And so it is today. When we don't submit ourselves to those things that the so-called Christian world today finds acceptable, we ourselves will be, be found in a similar situation. We must always be prepared to receive negative criticism just as Jesus did. If we don't, we betray our own salvation and justify the poor behavior of others. There are so many things in this world today that the so-called Christian world finds acceptable that the Bible makes clear or not. Now when those people who believe those things come up to us and say, well, why do you teach this? Or why do you teach that? Why, why does your church believe this, but we believe something different? We need to be able to answer them peacefully and in the right spirit, first off. But second, we need to know where our beliefs come from, where our understanding comes from. It's one thing to say, well, the Bible tells me. Well, my pastor said so. Well, I've got this track here. Let me let you read it, and that'll explain it to you. But it's something different altogether to say, let me, let me take you to the Word of God. This isn't what I believe. This isn't what my church teaches. This is what the Bible says. This isn't something that's been passed down from generation to generation and nobody knows where it came from. Here's the Word of God. Here, is, here are 15 passages of Scripture from all over the Bible that all go to back up this that we believe. This isn't my opinion. This isn't simply the doctrine of a local church. This isn't the doctrine of a denomination. This is what the Bible says. And if the Bible says it, it comes from God, we have no choice to accept it. This is the only way. If we want to be found pleasing to God, we have to do those things that God has explained to us clearly through His Word that He expects of us. Amen. And if we do that, rather than saying, because that's what my mom told me, because that's what the pastor said, because that's what this track I read says. If we do that by showing them the Word of God in love and in peace, then we have the potential to make a difference. But if we attack them, if we attack back when people attack us, all we're doing is proving that we're just as wrong as they are. Amen. Part two, new wine and new cloth. Luke 5, 36 through 39. I'm going to go ahead and read through 39. I think that verse is important here. And he spake also a parable unto them. No man putteth a piece of new garment upon an old. If otherwise, then both the new maketh a rent, 
and the piece that was taken out of the new agreeeth not with the old. And no man putteth new wine into old bottles, else the new wine will burst the bottles and be spilled, and the bottles shall perish. But new wine must be put into new bottles, and both are preserved. Verse 39, No man also, having drunk old wine, straightway desireth the new. For he saith, The old is better. Jesus did not merely stop at answering the specific question pertaining to fasting, but expounded through a parable to open their understanding to the deeper matter, which explains why Jesus was not teaching in the exact same manner as John or as the Pharisees and scribes. Now, I'll say something here that may be a little confusing at first, but I want to make clear what I'm trying to say. All humans are conservative by nature. Now, I'm not talking about politics here. I'm talking about the word conservative in its most unpolitical uh, definition. The word conservative describes a desire to keep things the way they are. It's a dislike or an aversion for change. We want things to say the same. That's what it means to be conservative. We want to conserve what we know. We want to keep things the way they are. Even those who crave diversity have an aversion to change. Their desire to retain their diversity and not settle for a smaller variety is a conservative attitude. The Jews of Jesus' time were no different. They had the things, they had things the way they liked it for so long that when the Word made flesh was revealed, they were unwilling to change. They saw Jesus as a threat to their way of life, just as sinners see Jesus as a threat to their way of life today. They don't want the new because the old wine is better. Now, you, you ask any alcoholic, and they'll tell you they want the old wine because the old wine is the fermented wine. They don't want grape juice. The new wine is grape juice. The old wine is alcoholic in nature. It's old because it's had that time to ferment. Or it's fermented because it's old because it's had that time. The new wine is freshly squeezed. It's not fermented. They don't want that. They want that old wine. They want what they're accustomed to. They don't want things to change. People don't want things to change. But at times, at all times, there will be those who allow themselves to be influenced by the Spirit for their own good. And then change will come. Not only will we stop the, having that aversion to change, we'll have that desire to change. We'll, we'll recognize those failures in our own lives and we'll want to do away with those things and separate ourselves from them. At some point in our past, each of us submitted to the changes required by God for his people. That conservative nature that we had, we laid aside in deference to God's will for our lives. And suddenly, we had a desire to do those things that please God. And now, we want to do those things. Those things that we once did our best to avoid, now we seek them out. And so it was with the, with the disciples. Those things that they had no desire to have a part of suddenly became important to them. Those things that we never had a desire in our sinful past to be a part of now are, are an important aspect of our lives. The most critical, should be the most critical aspect of our lives. I think I had a comment back in the back. I was thinking kids don't like change either. <laughs> I've noticed that uh, when you're teaching children for the first time, usually they're really good. Because mm -hmm. they're learning how to test you, mm -hmm. which you allow them to get allow them to get by with. And so if you let them get by with things and then all of a sudden you start making rules up, they don't like that very well. And I've noticed that when I have teacher friends that have a whole list of rules the first day of school mm -hmm. so that they know exactly what the rules are before they even get started. Lay down those boundaries. They have the boundaries and that's how kind of how we are today. We need those boundaries and we need those things so that you're talking about how 
children specifically don't like change. I, when, as soon as you said that, I thought about um, Dragon. He, uh, he spent the night with us one night, and we we're going to take him to church in the morning. And I don't want to go to church. I don't want to go to church. You can't make me go to church. You can't make me go to church. I don't want to go to church. He was just a little bitty. And well, older than him, wiser than him, more capable than him. He went to church. He, he, he wasn't happy about it, but he came to church. Well, once he got here, he realized it wasn't so bad. And lunchtime came around and everything was done. I don't want to go home. You can't make me go home. I don't want to leave here. <laughs> but that's the way sometimes we are as humans. Whatever the situation that we're comfortable in. He wasn't comfortable because this was something new. He, he hadn't been to church on a regular basis. He didn't know what to expect. So it was scary to him. He, he wanted to avoid it. But once he got here and found out it was, wasn't that bad, he didn't want to leave. <laughs> and so it is in our lives. There are things that we, we may not initially enjoy, but we become, accustomed, we become accustomed to them. And so when something else comes along, I don't want to do that. Uh, even though it may be good for us, even though it may be beneficial to us physically, not even spiritually, even though it may be physically beneficial to us. We tend to avoid those things simply because it's change. But God knows our attitudes. God had put this mindset in us for a reason. Because He knows that if, if those things that are causing us pain and those things that are causing us damage physically and, and mentally and emotionally and, and financially are, are so important to us that we will cling to them, What's going to happen when he shows us the true treasures that he has to offer? How much more important are they going to be to us? That attitude in us isn't bad. That attitude for desiring to avoid change isn't bad. It helps us when it comes to the spiritual. Because by that attitude, we have a desire to remain faithful to God. By that attitude, we have a desire to do those things that please him and grow in our understanding of him. With all thy getting... Get understanding. Brother Chris. Yes. I've heard you say many times that you don't like change. Mm -hmm. How do you how do you battle that? It's hard. It's it, it's very difficult to battle the desire for things to remain the same. But what we have to do as servants of God is we have to be sensitive to the Spirit. And we have to uh, submit. When those things come along that we may not like, we have to take it to God. We have to, we can't, we can't, we, as Christians, we should know, we should know that we can't lean on our own understanding. That's Bible. We can't lean on our understanding. We have to take it to God. And when we do, there, there will be times where we'll take things to God and we'll say, Lord, I, I don't like this situation that, that's coming against me. I don't like this that, that makes me think that I'm going to have to start doing things differently than the way I've been doing them. And if we take it to God with an open attitude, he'll, He will reveal what it is. Either He will say, this isn't of me. You don't have to worry about this. This isn't something that you have to concern yourself with. Or he will say, this is my choice for your life. Even if it's something that's difficult, even if it's something that pain, that's painful, if, God, if we take it to God and he says, this is critical for your spiritual survival. This is something that you need in order to cause you to grow closer to me. This is something that you need, not necessarily for your own sake, but maybe for somebody else's sake. We have to be open to receive that. But the very first thing that we have to do, as soon as we have something in our lives that we're not, we're not very happy with, that we feel like is going to have to make, we're going to have to make adjustments to the things that we're comfortable to, we have to recognize the need to take it to God. Because there will be those things in our lives that, that the enemy places in our lives that are uncomfortable, that we think we're doing God's will. Now, I, I, just making an assumption here, but I think about uh, Saul, who later became Paul. He did some pretty bad things in his life, and he was certain in his mind that he was doing God's will. 
Now, at some point, the enemy put it in his heart that he needed to do these things. And he didn't take those things to God. He just said, well, I'm looking at what everybody's teaching me and everybody says, and this is the right thing to do. I need to start persecuting this, this uh, sect to call themselves the way, and I need to get rid of them. He didn't take it to God in prayer. He didn't seek God's will. He allowed this change from the enemy to take, take him, take him over, rather than taking this to God for his direction. And like I said earlier, there are things in our lives that we have to suffer. There are things in our lives that we don't have a choice but to bear. And we may not see, God may not reveal to us immediately the reason for the suffering that we face, for the the trials that we have to go through. But if we trust Him, we'll be benefited. There there are so many times where where I see in my own life or in the lives of others uh, struggles that people have had to go through. Sometimes the struggle that they had to go through, whether it was myself or somebody else, sometimes the struggle that they had to go through was for their own benefit, to strengthen them for something that was coming that would be coming against them later. Other times, <clears throat> the difficulties that people face are not for their own benefit, but by the struggle that they are able to overcome by the power of God working in them, they can be a benefit to others. God was able to help me to overcome this trial, and as a result, I know that He can do the same for you. People don't, people are not uh, influenced by the change they see in us unless it's directly relevant to them. Uh, think about uh, if if I if I have overcome some great thing by the power of God by no strength of my own, and someone comes up, comes, I, I come across someone who has the same problem, and I say, this is something that I've dealt with personally. I understand what you're going through because I've been exactly in the same place that you've been, and by the power of God, I was able to overcome. That gives them firsthand encouragement to know that they have hope as well. Change is difficult. But if we take it to God and it is from God for our benefit or for the benefit of those around us, it will be well worth it in the end. We have to be willing to lay aside anything in our lives that's old when God tells us to, even if it's something that isn't necessarily sinful. There are plenty of things that we've been called away from in our lives that have no sinful influence in them whatsoever, but God has said, this is something that you need to move away from. You need to move in this direction. Whatever it is, the whole point of this parable, we're still talking about new cloth and and new wine here. Whatever it is in our lives that God directs us to leave behind, if we don't, Not only are we hindering ourselves and our own spiritual growth, but we're hindering the spiritual growth of those around us, perhaps our family, our friends, those who may be lost now and in need of hope may remain lost because of our unwillingness to change according to God's will. And a commentary here real quick. Matthew Henry observes, Christ's disciples were not able to bear those severe exercises so well as those of John and of the Pharisees, which the learned Dr. Whitby gives the reason, this reason for. They were, there were among the Jews not only sects of the Pharisees and Essenes who led an austere, that is a strict, life, but also schools of prophets who frequently lived in mountains and deserts and were many of them Nazarites. They had also private academies to train men up in a strict discipline, and possibly from these many of John's disciples might come, and many of the Pharisees. Whereas Christ's disciples, being taken immediately from their callings or their normal jobs, had not been used used to such religious austerities, strictness. They were unfit for them, and would by them rather be unfitted for their other work. Many, many of the religious religious elite of Jesus' time had been raised up 
from their youth to believe and practice some of the strictest sets of beliefs of the Jews. Opposed to each other, though some of them were, they sought to fulfill the law by their own strength, by their own ability, by their own means. But the disciples, they were just simple working class people. They hadn't been brought up this way. They didn't have the experience of those who had focused fully on the law from the time they were born. As a result, they needed training from the Son of God Himself until they would be filled with the Holy Ghost on the day of Pentecost. If they had been forced into man-made plan of law obedience and fasting, they would have failed just as miserably as the Pharisees and the Sadducees had. They would be no more prepared to spread the gospel than those who had already rejected Jesus. <clears throat> Jesus picked these 12 disciples and prepared a training program designed just for them. Regardless of what the Pharisees or John's disciples thought, God knew exactly what kind of training was in order for these men. As we come to read in, at a later time, Jesus' teaching and hands-on training were very successful. For they launched the church into a great period of Holy Ghost revival and growth. And we, when we become fully submitted to God's plans for our lives, the same will be said of us. But now is the time to recognize and forsake our own attitudes of superiority toward the lost. When we do, then God will be able to use us for His glory. What's holding us back? We need to find God's will and let any preconceived ideas be flushed from our minds and hearts for God's glory to be revealed in us. <clears throat> Part 3, Wisdom in the Ministry, Exodus 13, 17, and 18. And it came to pass when Pharaoh had let the people go that God led them not through the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near, for God said, lest peradventure the people repent when they see war and return to Egypt. But God led the people about through the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea. And the children of Israel went up harnessed out of the land of Egypt. <clears throat> Excuse me. Part A, God's wisdom displayed. Matthew Henry gives reasonable thought to this passage. Such was God's care of his Israel when he brought them up out of Egypt not to lead them by the way of the Philistines. Can you see the wisdom that God used in directing Moses to take the Israelites around the land of the Philistines rather than to confront them? While God is mighty and powerful, certainly He could have defeated the Philistines in order to shorten Israel's journey, but He chose not to. Through God's mighty hand, Moses was able to secure the freedom of Israel from Pharaoh. They had been in slavery for 400 years, but now freedom had come. It's reasonable to consider that the emotional state of Israel was rather fluid at this time, since they were still digesting much of what was happening. God knew that if they faced an adversary such as the Philistines this soon, it would be discouraging and possibly devastating to them. He therefore instructed Moses to take them by the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea. <clears throat> Excuse me. Well, I'm thinking about this, uh, this the lesson here says that they had been in slavery for 400 years. They didn't know anything but work and getting beaten. They didn't know anything about war. They didn't know anything about strategy. They didn't know anything about anything except doing what they were told. Now, God's ways are not our ways and His thoughts not our thoughts. The Jews might not have even known that the way of the Philistines was even an option. But God knew for certain what their response to war would be. This isn't something that he had to guess. He didn't have to suppose or assume how they would react. He knew full well that they needed more assurance of who he was. As a result, he led them to the edge of the Red Sea, knowing that the Egyptian forces would soon be upon them. God had already defeated all the Egyptian gods when he sent the plagues upon them. Now he would re reveal his power over the armies of Pharaoh. Not only that, but he would repeat, reveal part of the extent of his power in the dividing of the Red Sea. 
they would soon know that it was God's desire to protect and to provide for His people, and that they were His people. Just like we do today, we do today they may have questioned God's reasoning or even the validity of His concern for them when they saw the dilemma they were in. How many of us have seen uh, something coming our way? Oh, what am I going to do? How am I going to handle this? I don't, I don't know how to handle this situation. This situation is way too big for me. What am I going to do? God must really be mad at me because I must have done really something bad because God wouldn't do this to me if I, was so bad, if I was better than I am, but I must have done something really bad or I wouldn't have this horrible situation coming on me right now. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? What am I going to do? We know, we should know that God's in control. Are, are we servants of God? If we are, then we need to understand what it means to serve Him. Sometimes it means that we have to suffer. Sometimes it means that we have to struggle. Sometimes it means that the things that, that come our way aren't pleasant but we have the assurance, we should have the assurance that God knows what He's doing. God, uh, the book of Job, I love the book of Job because it makes clear that not all the things that, that we suffer in our lives are a, a direct result of something we've already done. Sometimes we suffer for the benefit of others. Sometimes we suffer for some unforeseen thing that's coming our way that we need to have the strength to be able to face later. And God allows us to struggle a little bit now. We'll have the faith to be able to endure. I, I love Abraham and, and the story of how he suffers all these things. He's called away from his family and he, he has to do all these things and it's it just little and little and little. God takes him through difficulties one after another, the loss of his father, all these trials that he continues to face and then one day he says, I want you to take your only begotten son and I want you to sacrifice him for me. Abraham, what? You want me to do what? He didn't say, I'm not going to do that. He said, okay, first thing in the morning, we'll go. Well, we all know how the story ended, but the fact of the matter is, he didn't stumble when God said, I want you to sacrifice your son. Because he had struggled all along the way and saw God's provision. He saw the power that God had in his life to overcome every obstacle that he faced. And so when this huge thing came his way, he was able to say, well, look, I, I look back at my life and all the things that God's already done. Psh, this is just another one of them. I don't know what God's going to do, but if he told me to do it, I'm going to do it because I know that God knows better than I do. Amen. Every time in the past that I did something God told me not to, it didn't work out so well. Every time that I did exactly what God told me to do, it worked out much better. Even if I had to struggle through it. And so it will be with this situation. Whatever it is that we're facing in our lives, however difficult the trial may be right now that we're having to go through, know that God's not ignorant of your suffering. God's not just making you suffer because He wants to look at you and laugh at you for how you, how you respond. He's concerned for our every need. He's concerned for our every struggle. We should know that. We should know that. But so many times when these trials come against us, we just we fall on our face and we don't know what to do. But God has the answer. God knows what He's doing. God is not making us suffer in vain. God is not putting on us more than we can bear, but He's using the situation that we're facing to strengthen us for some future time that we may not even know about. God provided a way of hope when the children of Israel saw no hope for escape. God knew this was the best course of action for His yet unformed nation as well as us all of us who would come after them, if we will continue to trust in God when things don't seem to be going our way, He will see us through just as well as He saw them through. 
This is a part of the reason we find accounts such as this in the Word of God. There would come a time when Israel would be strong enough to face their foes, but it would not be at this time. Part B, God's wisdom in the church. Wow. Let's skip that first paragraph, go to the second paragraph. I'm going to close it out here in just a minute. The church is charged with preaching and teaching the gospel to the entire world. The principle of Bible wisdom is necessary for every pastor, teacher, and every other member of the church of God. It is not sufficient to merely say that we have presented the gospel to the world, but rather how we presented it is what makes the difference. We must present testimonies from a first-hand perspective. If we have never suffered only to be rescued by God, how can we effectively minister to those who are currently suffering? If we have never endured a trial by the power of the Spirit working in us, what hope do we have to offer the individual who is currently in the midst of a trial? We must be open to proclaim the gospel as God instructs us, as God instructs us to, as the conditions of each situation dictate. God knows what each individual needs in order to draw him or her to the truth. If we fail to find the mind of Christ, our ministries will remain fruitless. <clears throat> but if we allow the Spirit of God, full freedom to act through us according to the will of God, souls will be brought to a saving knowledge of the truth. And sadly, I have to stop there and turn it over because I am out of time. <laughs>